You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul, and I'm here with Haya Costello from Drone DJ as we give you this week's drone news. Hi, how are you doing, my friend? Very good, and uh, thanks again for having me on the show. It's been a few weeks, but it's good to be back. Hey, it has been a few weeks. Sorry, I uh, kind of left the country for a little while there, but I am back now, and it's uh, I love doing these shows with you. It's a lot of fun, and I'm ready to get right into it, as it sounds like drones are really playing a powerful role in saving lives across the world. Yeah, they sure do. And uh, this week we have two stories, and we'll start off with this one first, that really show how drones do make a difference in uh, in people's lives. Uh, there's been two students who have been using consumer drones, uh, a Phantom, a DJI Phantom to be exact, and they modified the drone, outfitted it with a thermal camera, and with the thermal camera they're able to spot landmines, and specifically landmines that you can't detect with uh, metal detectors or other mine sweeping technologies because they're all made out of plastic. Uh, specifically, this is called the Russian-made butterfly mine. However, with a drone and a thermal camera, they can actually pinpoint those mines in the landscape, and it's, it's been a great tool for them to, to help get rid of landmines. Wow. Uh, that is really powerful. I mean, I understand with thermal cameras that there has to be typically a large relative difference in temperature between the subjects we're looking for and the outside environment. So are they having to fly during a certain time of day in order to find these mines? Yeah, apparently the way it works is that uh, these students, by the way, who are called Jasper Bauer and William Fraser, uh, they wait for the sun to rise and heat up the landscape. And then as the, the surrounding area warms up, the landmines actually take much longer to warm up. So once the ground heats up with the thermal cameras, you can actually pinpoint exactly where those landmines are. And without thermal cameras, there really is no other way of finding these landmines. So having the thermal camera mounted on the drones, so you can quickly get this... this um, higher vantage point makes it much easier to locate these mines. It is so awesome to see the powerful role that drones are playing in saving lives even to this day. Uh, it is just truly awesome. What else do we have in this week's drone news, which it seems like the FAA has kind of sprung something on us as the government reopens? Yeah, for sure. This has come uh, as quite a surprise. I mean, I don't personally think it's a big deal, but uh, it was surprising to see the FAA come in and uh, come up with this rule so quickly, all of a sudden. As of February 23rd, anybody flying a drone will uh, not only have to register the drone like they used to before, but now they have to actually put the registration or the ID number that's issued by the FAA on the outside of the unmanned aircraft. So no longer are you able to uh, put a sticker, or let's say underneath your battery or in the battery compartment and, and put it inside the drone, if you will. The FAA will now require you to have it uh, visible on the outside so that if anybody needs to inspect the drone uh, before touching the drone or approaching the drone, they're able to identify the drone. And the real concern here was that uh, the FAA or law enforcement officials were afraid apparently that if you were to open up a drone and let's say it was booby trapped but you're opening up the the battery compartment to see the registration number that thing might blow up now i don't know how realistic that scenario is but um the faa felt it necessary to rush this uh, law and make it into effect as of february 23rd now typically when they come up with a new rule the uh, public has a 30-day period to provide comments on this rule uh, the public in this case can still do so however the rule is already in effect so any changes to it will be made after the fact um, however, I, I don't think in this case that is likely to happen. That is really fascinating. Uh, what are you seeing in the community online? It's not in the drone you community, but the greater drone community. What is the reaction that you're seeing on this new rule? Um, surprisingly enough, uh, at least in terms of the, the comments that we've seen on Drone DJ and also on Twitter, most people seem to understand this and a lot of people compare it to the numbers that you have on uh, boats and airplanes as well. Uh, identification numbers, of course, cars are a good example also. And I haven't heard that much of a resistance to this change. I've seen a little bit in some of the Facebook forums and groups and 
frankly, I just thought people were being a bunch of whiners, honestly. But in all honesty, it makes sense to me because if someone is actually going to commit some sort of crime with a drone, they're probably not going to take the time to register the drone and put a number on it. So this is a quick, easy identifier for the police to say, this may be a good drone or a bad drone. Obviously, it's not a bulletproof scenario, but I understand where LEOs are coming from. Now, that being said, you mentioned that there is no comment period because they thought that this rule affected public safety, thus they implemented it immediately. But it just reminded me to give a quick reminder to everyone listening to the show, the NPRM for flight over people was posted to the public register and you can comment on the proposed rules for flight over people now as the government has reopened and the the law has been officially proposed. Yes, uh, one quick thing. In this case, there is a period uh, for the public to provide comments on this rule. However, typically that happens before the rule comes into effect. In this case, the rule was already coming into effect as of the 23rd, and then people can still supply comments to it. So whether those comments are going to make a difference remains to be seen, but the rule is going to be in effect as of February 23rd. That is truly awesome. It sounds like in the news this week, there are some big developments between DJI and Europe. What's going on across the pond? Yeah, uh, exactly. Geofencing 2.0. That was already implemented in the US back in October last year. And now they've also implemented it, or they're going to implement it later this month in 32 European countries. Now, in 13 of those countries in Europe, they already had geofencing 1.0. So the more simple two-dimensional circles around uh, federal facilities or sensitive facilities as well as airports. Now they're upgrading to geo 2.0. And they also include 19 different European countries that had nothing uh, prior or most likely at least uh, none of those countries had anything in place. And all of these 32 countries in Europe are going to get the three-dimensional um, butterfly-shaped geofencing system in place, which is much more accurate and has a much more realistic risk-based approach to keeping drones out of the uh, airspace around airports, mostly. Now, of course, keep in mind that this applies only to DJI drones. So anybody flying a unique or para drone is not going to be affected by this. And also people that make custom drones uh, are not going to be affected by this as well. So this is really a measure that kind of keeps DJI drones out of the sensitive airspace. But again, it's not a foolproof method of keeping airspace around airports free of drones, of course. Now, will this affect all of DJI drones? Because it's my understanding that anyone flying an Inspire 1 or P3 or Mavic Pro on the old DJI Go app will not have access to Geo 2.0. Is that correct? That might be. I mean, of course, you have to upgrade the uh, DJI 4 Go app in order to get Geofencing 2.0. So if you don't want to be affected, uh, not upgrading is one way to get around it. The older ones that can't be upgraded anymore uh, won't be affected by this either. It's uh, pretty much certain, I guess. Awesome. Awesome. Well, in other drone news, it looks like one more state player is trying to claim their mark on airspace. What's going on here, Haya? Yeah, in Oklahoma, they're trying to uh, get a law in effect that is going to ban or restrict drone use by hobbyist drone pilots over rural areas in Oklahoma. Senator Casey Murdoch said that, uh, and I'll quote him here, uh, for right now, this private property rights issues and a privacy issue. And he said that what I'm doing is just giving the local law enforcement the ability to basically write a speeding ticket for someone that's not flying a drone within the FAA regulations. Well, to me, this sounds very weird because as long as you're flying within the FAA regulations, there really shouldn't be a reason for anybody getting a a so-called speed limit. Uh, ticket. And also the FAA enforced or restated last year that they are the only authority that is in any position to control the airspace in the US. Uh, And I'll quote them as well. They said in a statement last year that the state and local governments are not permitted to regulate any type of aircraft operations such as flight paths or altitudes or the navigable airspace. And uh, cities and municipalities are not permitted to have their own rules or regulations governing the operation of aircraft. However, as indicated, they may generally determine the location of aircraft landing sites through their land use powers. So this is very much similar to uh, the situation with national parks in which you are not allowed to fly 
you can land and launch your drone from outside the parks. And in this case, it'd be similar. You wouldn't uh, be allowed to land or launch your drone from private property, but you can do so outside of it. However, the state of Oklahoma is trying to ban flying over private property altogether as a hobbyist pilot. In their proposed legislation, they do make an exception for people who fly for uh, governments, uh, whether that's federal or state. Uh, law enforcement, oil companies, and also for people who fly uh, with a commercial drone pilot license, so part 107. However, if you're a hobbyist, they want to ban you from flying drones over private property, which I don't think this rule is going to be enforceable. I hope they're not going to try to make this into law. I think it's, uh, it's a step in the wrong direction for sure. Haya, it sounds like another geriatric senator didn't do his research before proposing this law, which shockingly is pretty normal in our legislative atmosphere, but very disappointing once again from this senator. As like you said, the FAA is the sole sovereign authority over the airspace. In addition, there is existing privacy rules which showcase the reasonable right to privacy and how you cannot inhibit the reasonable right to privacy. In addition, I don't know if there was anything discussed in the article as far as intent of using the drone, because I think that's really important anytime there are privacy issues at hand. But I think that the case of uh, Newport, is it Newport uh, or Newt? I can't remember the city now in Massachusetts, where essentially there was a city in Massachusetts who tried to regulate the airspace as well, and they were shut down in federal court. Just once again, another reminder that it's another senator who didn't do their research when proposing a law. Once again, shocker. But it sounds like while there is some troubling news, it seems like this week we are overrun with great news and how drones are really, really making a positive impact on the world. What do we have again this week? Yeah, there's another great story from Halifax, and um, it's it's nice to be able to end our, our news podcast with another story where drones are doing good for humanity. This is a story about firefighters who had already officially called off the search for a missing person. However, a group of firefighters who had uh, for the first time flown their new DJI Matrice uh, 210 earlier that same day, they decided to go up one more time. They had angled their infrared camera at a different angle, flying and, and, and searching that landscape in a different way. And sure enough, they find this guy who's been uh, lying down underneath a bridge in a very, very cold camp temperature. So he'd already been there apparently for three hours, uh, semi-unconscious. So he was, I mean, if, if the search had not continued, most likely he would not have survived the night. So lo and behold, they find this guy, rush him to the hospital. He ends up being okay. And the firefighters say that this was really a turning point for the use of drones in their field of work. And they now say that the drones are essential piece of equipment to keep firefighters safe. And also, of course, like this story in search and rescue missions. So I thought it was a very positive story. We covered it on Drone DJ. And it's another example of how drones make a difference in, uh, in people's lives. I mean, it is fantastic how drones are literally saving lives. But I think it's also important for anyone who's in public safety um, law enforcement, if you're doing search and rescue, it's really important to understand the limitations of thermal searching. You know, typically, Haya, we only have 24 hours within a given search period that thermal is going to help us. And I would say to anyone who is in public safety who hasn't invested in drones yet, please do your research on what equipment you may or may not need. Oftentimes, you can accomplish these jobs with much cheaper equipment than what a lot of these agencies are buying. And I say this because there are a lot of federal employees who have expressed serious uh, interest in getting the word out to law enforcement and public safety saying you don't have to buy these big expensive drones. You can buy you know, Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual and, and Phantoms mm -hmm. and really get the same level of uh, work out of them. And I think it's really important. You know, I just want to say, guys, please do your research. And there are great examples like this story where really an M210 uh, with the X-T2 or whatever they were flying is a great example of, you know, a high-powered thermal camera because I'm sure in Halifax they have those big trees and you're going to have to fly a little higher, I'm sure, to survey those areas. And in this case, you would need a more powerful thermal camera than, say, the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. But I just kind of want to put it out there, Haya, as you remember at the NTSB training, this was kind of a, a big theme. And I just want to put out the information that, you know, guys, before you go out and spend money for your agency, please do your research. You'd be surprised at um, 
how much you can do with certain equipment and it's again really based off the environment in which you are going to be flying. So anyway, Haya, that is one fantastic story. I'm so glad that literally in the last week, a drone has saved someone's life. That that really brings purpose to many drone pilots. Totally. And if uh, if I can add one thing to this, um, the firefighters in Halifax, they had a $60,000 grant that was um, issued back in 2016. Now, part of this, of course, was used, part of this money, of course, was used to uh, acquire the DJI Matrice 210 and the Zenmuse X-T2. However, a bigger part of the money was actually needed to train all the firefighters. And in this case, they have 18 firefighters that are trained and are now official Part 107 pilots, drone pilots. So... Uh, yeah, you can probably save some money on the equipment, but also keep in mind that you have to train enough people to actually fly these drones as well. Couldn't have said it better myself. And if Drone You can help out, we're always there for you. Check us out, DroneU.Education. Haya, on that awesome bombshell that you just dropped, I think that's going to do it for this week in Drone News, unless we missed anything. I think we uh, pretty much covered everything. And uh, glad to be back on the show and looking forward to the next one next week. Looking forward to it as well. Haya, thank you for joining us. And for everyone else, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to the show. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you download podcasts. Thanks again. That's going to do it for us today. You're listening to another episode of Ask Drone You. Drone You.